Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's. We are three film composers with nothing better to do. I'm Austin Terry, and I'm joined, as always, by my best friends, Matt Johnson and Keith Baker. Matt, how's it going? Well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm excited to debate some movie scores. Unfortunately, my submission, my number one submission for best film score of Chef didn't make the cut. I was really excited to talk about all the, um, you know, the electric guitar and the sounds of John Leguizamo, you know, grilling a fresh Cubano <laughs> in the background. I was really excited to talk about it, but unfortunately, some others beat it out. Man, you just uh, just won't let that chef joke die, will you? <laughs> nope. Keith, how are you doing? It's always good to see you. Oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm excited to debate these scores. I already have a clear winner in my mind. Ooh. I'm just hoping you guys feel the same, but we'll get oh, into I'm, it. I bet I can guess your the clear thing winner. I'm, the thing I'm excited about this show is last time, Ratatouille was like, the last time we did a bracket for food uh, movies, Ratatouille was kind of my clear winner, but this time... I have like two or three I think I'd be okay with winning. So at least I have a chance to get a win today. Well, as you can tell from the title, on today's show, we brought our brackets back. We are doing a debate on the best movie score of all time. We have 12 film scores lined up to duke it out for the biggest award they will ever receive. Whoever wins today is officially the best movie soundtrack of the Arnie's podcast. Matt, give us some thoughts so we can get right to our contest. Keep in mind, some of these have won the Oscar for Best Original Score, but I feel like in today's day and age, this might be the more prestigious award. Um, yeah, so th this was kind of an interesting one. We certainly, I mean, I guess I won't speak for you guys, but there was kind of a lot of, not research, but just time spent listening to all these, at least for me, like probably a few hours over the last few days, just because... I feel like with most of the movies we're about to talk about, there's a couple pieces in the score that are pretty iconic, and you kind of don't need to listen to those, but I guess I kind of felt like in order to really break down these scores, I needed to listen to the rest of them, at least a little bit. So it did change some of my original opinions. So I guess I'm kind of excited today because I'm curious what your guys' criteria is, because we could certainly talk about the most iconic scores. We could talk about the scores that have left like the longest impact we could talk about the most played scores we could talk about what we think is the best so there's kind of a lot of criteria so this is going to be interesting i think yeah i think maybe maybe just right now before we get into it let's establish some criteria i think one of the things for me is how does it make you feel when you're listening to it mm -hmm. i think that's an important one i think something else we, we might need to consider is these don't necessarily have to be good movies to win this yes. contest, but I do think these scores do need to add to the film in some capacity. I agree with that. How well it fits with the theme in the film, I guess. And that's going to be a big one for me, because there are some of these scores, upon re-listening to it, I feel like they're good just listening to them, but I feel like there was some when I listened, I was like, oh yeah... I know, like, I can remember which scene that was in. And there's some that I listened to, and I was like, if you told me this was from a different movie, like, I, that wouldn't surprise me. So that's going to play into my rankings a bit. Okay, so I think, I think I've got it. The three criteria for, for something to move on will be if you enjoy listening to it, mm -hmm. how it adds to the film, mm -hmm. and if it can take you back to a specific scene in the movie when you listen to it. Mm, okay. Okay, that's I'm pretty like good. That. Alrighty, now that we got those rules established, Keith, why don't you tell our lovely listeners who our one-seaters are today? The one-seaters for today are Star Wars, composed by John Williams. Johnny Boy. Johnny Boy. The Dark Knight by Hans Zimmer. What do you want, Hans? And then we got Interstellar, also by Hans Zimmer. And then we got another John Williams, Indiana Jones. Very good. All righty. So it, what Keith just read you are our one-seaters. Everything that wins in this upcoming round will go on to face one of those films. And let's just get right into it. Um, our first contest that we have today is the score of the Grand Budapest Hotel versus the score of the original Mission Impossible. The Grand Budapest Hotel score is composed by Alexandre Desplat, and it did receive the Oscar for the best original score. And the Mission Impossible score was composed by Danny Elfman, who replaced Alan Silvestri in production. 
And also included in the score is U2's remake of the original theme, which was certified gold and a top 10 hit on the Billboard 200 when this film came out. Wait, <laughs> wait, what is what was the U2 remake? Was it instead of like the original was dun, 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 was the remake dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly couldn't That's tell perfect. a difference, but it is the it is the main theme in the movie, like the opening theme. Bono, is he just making the sounds with his mouth? <laughs> it's not even Bono; it's two of the back backup guys, the like edge, the guitar, and the drummer. I think. Wow. Well, I know my winner <laughs> based on that. <laughs> and also, listeners, I do need to mention we did want to be able to play you guys some examples from these scores. However. The rights to these soundtracks are very expensive, and we do not have much of a production budget for the show. So, mm. we did find a bunch of clips of free songs that sound what this movie score could possibly sound like. And listeners, here is what the Grand Budapest Hotel score might sound like if we had a production budget. And here's what the Mission Impossible soundtrack might sound like if we had a budget. Is this the Bono version? Okay, pretty close. I mean, at the beginning, and then it kind of goes <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, Keith, why don't you start us off? Who are you going to be voting for? All right, well, I think The Grand Budapest is a great movie with a good score. I still got to go with Mission Impossible. Okay. I grew up with Mission Impossible. That soundtrack, I love the opening for every movie with that, uh, the original score for that one. You know, if I'm going to try to apply this song to like a scene, I just think of any scene in any of the Mission Impossible, all seven of them, eight of them, can't remember what number one now. Um, whenever Tom Cruise is doing some sort of action maneuver, and then the the theme start the same theme song starts playing again. So yeah, that's how that's why I like this song a lot. I think it just fits in with the uh the whole action sequence of all those movies. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Mission Impossible. Yeah, I I do think the Mission Impossible theme song is just so iconic and it just gets stuck in your head. It's like a little earworm when you hear it. However, I'm gonna throw a vote for the Grand Budapest Hotel score. Um, this score is really unlike anything I've ever heard before. I think it uses some really unique instruments. It's really, I guess you would describe it as like Russian folk, which is something you don't hear too often, especially in mainstream media. Um, it use, he uses heavy use of the Balakia instrument, which I you don't really hear a whole lot of. Um, actually, in that free sound clip, that is also a Balakia playing there. Dang. You got technical with this. Um, and also this film, it does have to uh, establish the world of a fictional country. And I think this score really becomes its like own unique character within this movie. Um, I think it adds to every scene. It really fits um, the different like stories and different characters. Like each character has their own theme here. Um, and I think it's just really light and fun to listen to. And I really enjoy just listening to the soundtrack on its own. Cool. Respectable. So Matthew, you have the deciding vote here. Where are you going? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to echo your points there i think grand budapest looking at our list it is probably in terms of iconic it's probably the bottom i think there's nothing that's particularly iconic about it but if you're looking at quality i think it's great i think there's some variety that really um while they use a lot of the same instruments it does feel like they're really hitting a bunch of varying ranges of emotion and it is quite a good listen it's very beautiful it's very just it kind of like warms your heart even in some of the more kind of sadder songs and i think the reason i'm going to ultimately vote for it is well i do think the mission impossible score is very solid and it does bring me back i think even though it's so amazing and certainly iconic i think it's basically like i'm comparing a whole score versus just the mission impossible theme so I think that's why I'm gonna give it to Grand Budapest. I think there's just I think there's just more there. But if we're talking about like quality, iconic, just pieces of music, I, I would be hard pressed to beat like that Mission Impossible theme with any of them. But yeah, I think for now I'm gonna go Grand Budapest. Alrighty. Yeah, I think if you look at both of these works as a whole, like when you think of the Grand Budapest Hotel, like 
you think of these very unique soundtracks, you think of like an almost like an otherworldly type soundtrack. Whereas with Mission Impossible, like Matt said, you really only think of that iconic main title sequence. Um, so I, I think just if you're judging by the work as a whole, I think the Grand Budapest soundtrack beats out Mission Impossible. All right. Well, the Grand Budapest Hotel will go on to face Star Wars in round two. <gasps> Whoa. Okay, moving right along here. Our next debate is Harry Potter, the soundtrack of Harry Potter versus Back to the Future. Harry Potter is scored by John Williams. Um, he only scored the first three movies, but he did write a lot of the recurring themes that appear in the entire franchise as a whole. So we're going to stick with they him. They just used the same shit over and over again. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it really matters. He did the hard work. This score in the original Harry Potter was also nominated for the Best Original Soundtrack Oscar at the Academy Awards. And here is what the Harry Potter soundtrack would sound like if we could afford the rights to it. It sounds like I'm playing RuneScape or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just had to get I just had to get the flute in there. Yeah. Um <laughs> All righty. And Back to the Future is scored by Alan Silvestri, who was replaced on Mission Impossible, but he's back for Back to the Future. This score was nominated for the Grammy for the best score soundtrack. And here is what Back to the Future sounds like if you just wanted to listen to a free version. Yeah, that wasn't too far off, I guess. <laughs> like a, there were some similarities there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me, I'll go first just because I kind of feel like my argument's going to be relatively similar here. Um, and I think this will be the last time I need to use this argument, so I'll just try and get it out of the way. I think Back to the Future is great. I think it's a really, not only great movie, but I think the sound, not I shouldn't say the soundtrack, the score really fits in with um, kind of the ups and downs of this film and just kind of the adventurous kind of tonality to it. And I think the theme is just incredible. I think it's so fun. Um, but similarly to what I said last time, I think the best part about the score is the theme. Not that that's a bad thing. I think with most of these movies, kind of the main theme is the most iconic. In some cases, it's probably the best. But I guess the only argument I could really make against it is while it is great in Back to the Future, I just think Harry Potter, it has the Hedwig theme, which is kind of like the main title theme that we think about. But I mean, I also think about um, more of like the sadder um, parts of the score. I think about whenever it's Christmas in those movies, there's a totally different score that they use in every movie. I think whenever villains are around, they use some like darker kind of slower tunes that just like really get ingrained. So maybe it's just I'm more familiar with it. Maybe that's ultimately what I'm saying, but I guess there's just more variety to Harry Potter. And while I think they both invoke similar kind of nostalgia and feelings i guess maybe i just feel more strongly about the harry potter score i think there's a bit more variety there so i'm gonna go with that keith i have a feeling you're gonna disagree with matt so why don't you go ahead it's not leviosa <laughs> it's leviosa <laughs> i don't disagree with anything matthew said but i do have to go with back to the future just because back to the future was in my childhood i watched that movie over a hundred times. Um, and that song is, you know, always been ingrained in me, uh, the theme song and, uh, the other songs presented in, it. I guess kind of like what you were saying with Harry Potter, uh, like when they go to the, the wild west and all that, they change the, the theme just a little bit to make it a little bit more twangy, uh, to pertain to 1885 versus 1955 or to, uh, 1985. So when they go from year to year or from, or from different location, to location it changes the song just just enough to where you can kind of tell it's they're in that time period which i kind of liked about that so yeah i'll go with back to the future on this one i still love john williams but um no keith you hate him i hate, you hate him you didn't keith. vote for his movie <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. funny no i i don't really disagree with anything you guys said um this back to the future is kind of unique for me because i actually haven't seen the back to the future franchise so listening i've I will give credit to this uh, score, though, because even listening to the soundtrack, I still recognize a lot of these themes, even though I haven't seen the movie. So that just goes to show how popular how popular they are. Mm -hmm. And I do think the Back to the Future soundtrack kind of captures the magic of the movies, I would say. Like listening to it just puts me back in a the movie theater, even though I haven't seen 
that specific movie. Um, however, I'm going to have to vote for Harry Potter as well, just because I don't think I can picture this franchise set to any different themes. And every everything everything that Matt called out, Hedwig's theme, Christmas at Hogwarts, I had that written down in my notes as well. Like those those all those different songs put you uh, put you back in the theater and in those certain scenes. Um, like I can picture Halloween in the Great Hall when I hear that that soundtrack. I can picture Christmas at Hogmeade's when I hear that theme playing. Um, I, I just think that score is so effective when you listen to it. I feel ya. Alrighty. Well, Harry Potter will go on to face the Dark Knight in round two. That's going to be easy. <laughs> but what am I talking about? Maybe it's not what you think. <laughs> well, let's get into this next contest. We have the Social Network versus Drive. Um, the Social Network was composed by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, and it won a Golden Globe and Academy Award for the Best Original Score. And then we have Drive, which was composed by Cliff Martinez, and it won the Satellite Award for the Best Original Score. Here is what the Social Network might sound like if we could actually afford the rights to it. Yeah, I get, the, I get where they were going with that, but <laughs> it didn't sound too familiar. But let's let's hear Drive. Let's see what they get. Yes, and here here is Drive. Yeah. Okay. I get where they're going with that one as well. Um, so I actually submitted both of these. For my favorite. So I'm going to let one of you guys go first, just because neither of you guys submitted this one. So I'm curious what one of your guys' thoughts are off the bat. I, um, I'm going to vote for Drive. Um, I think Drive as a movie really took the world by storm when it came out. But I think what a lot of people forget is that the soundtrack also really took the world by storm as well. Like people were purposely going out and buying the soundtrack just to listen to it because it was so unique. The electronic and alternative elements just really mix so mix so well together here. And like when I hear that Hammer theme song playing, it puts me back into that really iconic scene within the movie. Um, and for such like a stressful movie, the soundtrack is actually pretty peaceful. Um, and so I think it's just really like an enjoyable listen on its own. I guess I guess I'll just go ahead and give my points then because I guess I kind of teased it right there. I think it's a great score. I do. Um, I think the best parts about it of the movie when you watch it as I really like the actual songs, parts of the soundtrack with lyrics, like a real hero at the end, I think is just amazing. I think the score is really solid and this is an interesting pair because I don't, I really don't have too much else to say about drive. I think both of the bits of the score that Austin called out are definitely, I think I drive and hammer are the best parts. Um, but with the social network upon re listening to it, I just think out of, cause like I said at the beginning, I mean, I didn't have like a free, like six hours to listen to just everything straight through. Um, so I just kind of had to go through it a little bit. But easily out of all of these movies, I listened to the Social Network one the most just because I found it so surprising and affecting. I mean, I think people talked about that at the time, but the fact that they got Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails to do the score for this movie was definitely weird. I mean, it's basically just, you know, on paper, it's a biopic about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. Why did you get like fucking trent Reznor to do the score for it but surprise it's so me. interesting that this is the one you listen to the most because this was the one that i had kind of forgotten about like i definitely remember it being good when i saw it in theaters but i'd kind of forgotten about it and listening to it like i couldn't i couldn't do it in one sitting i had to take breaks because like i i wouldn't be able to focus on my work while listening to it like it would it would just stress me out too much and i'd have to go change it to something else I get that. I think that's on purpose, though. I think Drive, for example, in this particular matchup, even though Drive is a violent and dark movie, the score is a bit more peaceful and calming. I think The Social Network is a really fucked up in a different kind of way movie, and I think really stressful. I think that reflects in the score. But the main thing I want to call out is, first of all, they use instruments you wouldn't expect. I mean, there's just like shaky strings. It's like, what? Like whenever you think about Mark Zuckerberg found Facebook and it's the biggest thing in the world. It's like, why is this the <laughs> score? But while listening to it, I was just so surprised that I feel like more than most of these movies, this one really kind of put me back into certain scenes. I knew exactly where I was in the movie, even though I hadn't seen it in a while. And it really, I think, did a brilliant job of showing off characters' emotions. Like when certain songs are like 
really angry. It's like, I think this is like, this is the part whenever the Winklevoss twins were in their scene, like finding out about Mark Zuckerberg stealing their idea. And then there's some that are a bit more kind of light towards the beginning, whenever he's like founding Facebook. And it's like, oh, this is going to be kind of cool. And then towards the end, whenever like they bring um, hand covers bruise back, which is kind of the main theme, whenever they bring back uh, for the reprise at the end, it's just like, it's so sad. And like, it just really reflects that even though this isn't the type of score you would expect for this kind of biopic, I mean, it's just a really kind of sad look at this guy's life, who's frankly, as time has gone by, I think we realize he's kind of just a sad human being. And I think the score really did a great job of like putting me in individual characters' shoes, which I think is more than I can say for most of the movies on here. And again, that's not a requirement. I just found it kind of like an, a bit of extra credit, I guess. Like I was surprised that like, I could remember individual character motivations and scenes just by listening to like each of the different parts of the score and just the surprising factor of Trent Reznor and like the instruments they used really kind of put it over the edge for me. So I'm going to vote for that. All right, Keith, you've got the deciding vote for both these movies. I think the score has captured the theme of them uh, perfectly Um, for social network. When I think of that, when I think of the beginning of it, whenever it kind of start, the music starts off soft, and it and I think it shows the year two thousand three. I could be mistaken on that. Yeah, and it starts off in the col- right. starts off at Harvard. Um, they're all kind of doing their college things, you know, girls and guys are drinking and all that, and he's up in his room typing away on his computer, coding and all that kind of stuff. That's what I think of when I think of social network, and when I think of the score is um, of that that opening scene or scenes. So I thought it captured that pretty good. Um, for Drive, well, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna say it. I'm gonna go with Drive on this one for for several reasons. For the first one, there's one part of the movie I, I want to say it's probably several parts of the movie actually, where it does like a little scan over L.A. and it and it I can't really do without humming it. I'm not gonna hum it because that just sounds stupid. But hum it, Keith. No, it. actually, I know I don't even think I can hum it. I just I can only really you know, listen to it in my head. But, um, I think it captures like the underground LA of that movie. And then when you go into, uh, Ryan Gosling scenes in the hallway with the girl and it kind of, like you said, Austin, it kind of, it kind of is soft, softer than you think it would be. And it kind of just goes back and forth between him being with the girl in the hallway and having like that soft background music to him being in the car, running away from something and it just going crazy. So, yeah, I think for me, I think Drive definitely didn't win by a landslide, but wins over Social Network. All righty. Well, Drive is going to go on to face Interstellar um, in round two. And in our final contest of round one, we have Mad Max Fury Road, composed by Junkie XL and nominated for the Saturn Award for Best Music, going against the original Blade Runner, composed by Vangelis and nominated for a Golden Globe for the best original score. And here is what Mad Max might sound like if we had the rights to it. I mean, that's pretty spot on. I mean, the whole Mad Max score (laughs) is just that over and over again. (laughs) (laughs) And let's now take a listen to the free version of Blade Runner. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> All right. All right. I, I got to go first here. Um, I'm voting for Mad Max. This is one of my favorite soundtracks, I think, of all time. Um, I genuinely like cannot imagine this film without this score attached to it. And I also really don't think this movie would have been as well received um, if the, if it didn't have this specific soundtrack. That's so much of an impact I think it makes on this film. Um, I think it takes the like rock opera style and just takes it to a whole nother level. Um, the drums, the guitar, like everything about it. Um, every time I listen to it, I just picture that uh, Duff Warrior with his guitar, like in the, in the Mad Max convoy going off to battle. Um, and just it, ha- it takes all my favorite elements of like rock and roll and heavy metal and just elevates them and puts it on display. And I think like the soundtrack just gets your adrenaline going, which is what the movie's also trying to do as well. Um, and it makes you feel like you're in the wasteland. 
Yeah, I definitely appreciate that. Um, I yeah, you know, I just made a jab at Mad Max listening to that. You know, just saying it's just kind of like the same thing over and over again. Um, and it's not. It's definitely not. There is there is some variety to this score. I feel like, and I could be wrong. I don't think there's like one theme necessarily, but we do get variety in terms of like parts at the beginning of the movie, like the escape, and then once the chase starts really heightening. I think the best for the best one I'm um, here for me was like. I think it's called the storm or like the storm is coming. I guess just whenever they're going into the same. My favorite's the blood film. bag. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was a good one too. Um, I think the only reason I can't do Mad Max and I really do like it is while I agree with Austin that my adrenaline was actually getting pumped up, just like kind of like chilling out, like listening to it, even though I wasn't like actively doing anything, it was like, Oh yeah, this is exciting. It did after listening to it for a while, it did get a bit draining. And I guess you could make the argument that, that is a bit on purpose. Like it's just supposed to be kind of constant, um, just like the movie itself. Um, but if I'm going off a score and this may be, maybe this is just more telling about me. I feel like I'm always going to lean more towards like the emotional side. Now, while like Blade Runner's, um, score by Evangelist isn't as like, you know, like to the, to the same like heights as the Mad Max score. I just, I, f- I feel a bit more when I'm listening to it. And I really love Blade Runner. Maybe that's part of it. Um, and I love Blade Runner 2049 and anybody that hasn't seen either. Of them See, or speaking the- of that, I think if you had nominated Blade Runner 2049, I might be going the other way, but because it's the original Blade Runner, I got to go Mad Max just because the, the Blade Runner 2049 soundtrack was so unique to me. But since we're debating the original one, um mad max just takes the cake for me that's interesting i kind of feel like the blade runner 2049 score just takes the evangelist score like it literally just takes it and like kind of you know changes it adds a little bit to it but most of it's the same score i don't just i mean i think it's a great score don't get me wrong um but to that point i'm also gonna go with blade runner just because the fact that, that movie came out in like 1982 and the score feels like something that could have come out like last year i think is pretty cool it feels like way ahead of its time. I mean, we talk about stuff like social network and drive kind of the style of score that is, but then it's so cool to go back like 40 years and look at Blade Runner. It's like, Oh, I mean, that seems, does the Blade Runner soundtrack take you back to any specific scenes in that movie? Cause it doesn't for me. And whereas the Mad Max soundtracks does like, I can picture them on, um, like the gasoline tank. I can picture like, I mean, the to Duke be fair, I mean, you guitar, say, like it, I said. you say like the Doof warrior with the guitar and like, Oh, that I love that scene where they're on the gasoline tank. <laughs> That's the whole movie. I mean, they're all, they're always on a gasoline tank. <laughs> like like uh, when Bloodbag is is playing. I can yes, I, specifically I pictured I Tom saying. Hardy like on the front of uh of uh, that vehicle like chained up. Like it t- it puts me back like literally in specific scenes of the film. I'm giving you shit, but yeah, yeah. To your to answer your question, yes. Um, I think one of the best monologues of all time, and this isn't about movie scores, but the Tears and Rain monologue that Rucker Hauer gives. That fun fact was improvised by him. Like one of the most famous monologues of all time. He just kind of came up with on the spot. Um, and then like that leading into the closing theme, the end credits. I mean, man, it takes me back to basically the whole like last 30 minutes of the movie. And then also the initial setup, whenever the score really starts getting going initially, and he's like finding out about his mission, going after these synths. And then even the scene, which is really fucking boring in the movie when he's just sitting um, and he's just Harrison Ford, like for 10 minutes, just staring at a screen going, stop (laughs) enhance stop enhance it's just the score is always there and i just found it so cool because it set up this world that like i mean people talk about cyberpunk today i mean that didn't really exist i mean it's just brand new world and i just think it's so cool that they were able to come up with a score that felt brand new for its time and you can clearly see influences of today and while some people might say like like I said about Mad Max, I mean, it is kind of just the same kind of synthy electronic thing throughout. I'm I'm shocked that they were able to get some variety in there in terms of emotions, like the love theme, whenever he and Rachel are first kind of connecting, really, it was like kind of an affecting score, even though it's really just kind of synthy electronic music, which isn't something I listen to day to day. I certainly agree with you that like when Mad Max, when the, uh, when Blade Runner, when the Blade Runner score came out, it was like the first of its kind and really unique for the time. But I kind of feel the same way about this Mad Max score too. Like I've never heard anything else like this before. And especially like, I think of the three of us, I'm probably the biggest like heavy metal fan. And I just feel like this one captures like just some of my, like my favorite elements of heavy metal, um, like the drums, the guitar, like just the heart racing energy that heavy metal brings. 
Um, I just, I just feel like it captures that so well. And it, I just, I've never heard another soundtrack that sounds like a heavy metal concert, basically. That's fair. And before Keith goes, I'll just give one last point. Um, just to kind of simplify my argument, I think everything you're saying is spot on. Um, but I guess I kind of said at the beginning, for me, while I think the majority of the Mad Max score is kind of heavy metal and like the majority of the Blade Runner is kind of electronic synth music, I think for me at least, they got a bit more variety out of what Blade Runner did. I think the Mad Max score, frankly, is amazing and like the heights of it are just so exciting. Um, I guess the one thing I can say is I never felt drained because like I said, it's like one of them, you're just going to listen to heavy metal for most of it. The other one, it's just all electronic, but I kind of got tired and again, these aren't music, like styles of music I really listen to that much, but I did get a bit drained by the Mad Max one towards the end. So that's really the only thing I can say. I'm going to go Blade Runner. Yeah. All right. Good Keith. points. Good points. Take us home. Yeah, I was tied on this one, but uh, I think we're going to have to go with Blade Runner. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Mad Max was the only one I cared about. Uh, I was, 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 was going to say it before. Awesome. I should have said before, but Social Network was actually my number one. Oh, so I was like, damn. Oh, shit, I lost. So this is interesting. It's getting interesting. Dang. Well, for Mad Max, Austin, I definitely agree with all your points on Mad Max. But um, I think the thing that I like about Blade Runner a little bit more, like you said, Matthew, is that it has a little bit more variety. And I just... And yeah, like you said, for that time, that was a really cool soundtrack to come out. It fits the theme. When I think of any scene in particular, I think of that scene where Harrison Ford's character is in the um, in that like that weird bar. I don't know if you remember that. Mm-hmm. You remember that scene? Yeah, I that, that's the one I think of oh, when yeah. I think of this movie and this score mm-hmm. and um, and just the music in the background think- of that. Yeah, it's probably one of the most at- atmospheric scores, like it or not. I just feel like it, it really does kind of put you there for sure. It kind of feels like that world, yeah. Keith, I don't know how you can call yourself a rock and roll fan and not. I'm a rock and roll this. fan. What are you talking about? <laughs> but 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 that's my point here to Mad Max is it's heavy metal, which could be you could say these for like any any of these probably, but for Mad Max it could almost be easily replicated, like it. I'm not saying it's not original. Oh, I totally disagree with that. I don't think anybody could. Really? I yeah, I don't think it'd be possible to replicate this score. I think what Junkie XL brought to this, and because he kind of he's kind of Hans Zimmer's okay. like protege, but he also brings his own unique twist uh, to movie score making. And I think like him willing to really go all out on this score being a rock opera, um, I just think it makes it so unique. I don't think anybody else could have created this. But I could gotcha. see that same argument gotcha. working for Blade Runner. Yeah, as I think well. all of these, so. it's kind of just different sides of the same argument. Yeah, that's why when I said that, it's like, well, you'd almost say this for any of them. But, um, but yeah, I think I'm just going to have to go with Blade Runner on this one. Okay, well, that was an exciting first round. Um, some of those got pretty heated, pretty fun debates. Let's get in to round two, and we're starting with Star Wars. Composed by John Williams, won the Academy Award for the Best Original Score for A New Hope, nominated for the Best Original Score for Empire and Return, and nominated for the Best Achievement in Music for The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker. And uh, Star Wars is competing against the Grand Budapest Hotel, which won in the first round. And here is what Star Wars could sound right if John Williams made his music for free. I don't know what that was. (laughs) I don't think that sounded anything like Star Wars. (laughs) Okay, so everybody listening at home, we had a tough debate with Star Wars because we weren't sure if we should include the entirety of of the Star Wars franchise or just one movie. And basically what we ended up on is we've only done one movie for the prior contestants. So I think for this film, we're just going to do Star Wars episode one because that encompasses the work from the original trilogy and then also some new songs as well. So for this debate, we're going to do Star Wars, the Phantom Menace versus the Grand Budapest Hotel. Whoever would have thunk these movies would have been versing each other. And I would say, I would say in pretty much every, every bracket, (laughs) episode one loses. But if we're talking about score, 
Eh, it could be interesting. So Keith, as our resident Star Wars expert, as the fans would know, because they can our Star Wars they super can go fan. and listen to our Star Wars series, which we have covered the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. So Keith, please take it away. All right. Definitely going Star Wars in this one, <laughs> as you guys know. Um, not to take anything away from Grand Budapest, but, oh man, Star Wars, especially for Phantom Menace, um, as we were talking about with the Darth Maul theme, theme uh, Duel of the Fates, that's one of the best songs in that movie. But yeah, no, Star Wars is the iconic. The Darth Vader theme, the the overall Star Wars theme, the original theme. It'll always be in my head when it comes to movies. So, yeah, definitely taking the cake on this one for me. Yeah, this one's interesting because you kind of do get all of the best hits in this movie in a way. Like You get pieces of like all the original trilogy scores just like kind of repurposed for different parts. Um, like when it comes to Leia's theme or Luke's theme, you kind of get bits and pieces. Invader's theme, of course, you get bits and pieces of that whenever we see young Anakin like Padme on screen. You kind of get versions of that. Um, and I'm surprisingly so, like I kind of joked about, I'm probably gonna have to go Star Wars episode one here as well. I just think, regardless of your thoughts on that movie, I just think the music and the score is pretty undebatable. Grand Budapest was fantastic. I'm really glad I listened to it because I really didn't remember it that much. I just had like kind of like a, like preconception. Like I saw the movie once in theaters and I loved it, but I was like, I, I know, I know Wes Anderson. I know it's going to be like, kind of like you know, upbeat, short little bursts. Like, that's going to be his score. It's going to be the same thing over and over again. But actually, there's a lot of variety. And it's quite beautiful. And I really loved it. Um, I liked how each character had their own theme. But Star Wars also has that. And we also get Duel of the Fates, which Keith mentioned. I think it's, honestly, I think it's just one of, like, the most incredible, like, bits of score ever composed. I think it's so fucking hype. <laughs> I think it's so awesome. Um, talking about like remembering being in a theater or watching a movie for the first time, I mean, Duel of the Fates is like one of the best examples. Like, I'm never going to forget the Darth Maul fight and that theme. But it's also like, I mean, it's pretty emotional. Like, the way like they like do close-ups on each of the characters during that theme and it just paced so well and it's like, you can listen to it as like kind of like a fight anthem because that's kind of where it was used as Darth Maul's like fight theme. But at the same time, on its own, it's just, I really like Great listen. So I mean, I got I'm, I got to go Star Wars. I di I didn't think I would like if we were gonna go original Star Wars like just New Hope. While well, there's some amazing themes and co of course including the opening credits, like the opening crawl theme, I may have gone Grand Budapest just for the variety and how beautiful it is. But yeah, I got I got to go Phantom Menace here. Yeah, I I pretty much agree with everything you guys said. Um, and I, one of my big selling points when when we were in the first round was that the Grand Budapest Hotel. Um, for that film, they had to create their own country and create their own unique sounds and make everything work in that score. However, John Williams had to create an entire galaxy, and he does that extremely effectively. <laughs> um, and where, yeah. while I do think the Grand Budapest Hotel has an incredible score, um, so well done, Star Wars is just too iconic for the Grand Budapest Hotel to win here. So I think we're sending along the right selection. I think that's our first uh, unanimous vote right there. I think it is. All right. Congratulations to Star Wars. You will move on to the semifinals. And now we have The Dark Knight, composed by Hans Zimmer, which won the Grammy for the best soundtrack, going up against Harry Potter, composed once again by John Williams. And here is what The Dark Knight might sound like if we could afford the rights to it, and if Hans Zimmer worked for free. Okay, yeah, I see where they're A little bit. Okay, now that we've heard that beautiful free rendition of The Dark Knight, who wants to go first? I think I gotta take this one. Um, this one was interesting. I definitely remember when Dark Knight was submitted, whenever we were talking about options for this show, I was like, oh, of course, you gotta put Dark Knight in there. Um, but re-listening re to it, I was not impressed i mean <laughs> pretty much every bit on this soundtrack here's here here's how it goes every single one of these bits of the score starts like this 
<laughs> bum, bum, bum. Like, it's just this. I joked earlier about Mad Max being the same thing, but that is a discredit to Mad Max. This score is a literally the same thing over and over again. Even parts of the movie where I know what scene they're referencing, like there's a part called Why So Serious? And then there's also one called like The Dark Knight. It's so, like they're talking about that final scene with Gary Oldman saying he's the Dark Knight. It's just the same thing. Like, this whole entire score is the same thing. And is it good? Is it consistent? Yes. Like, that buildup is solid. But I think it's telling that there is a bit on this score called, like, I Am the Batman. So it's supposed to be, like, the Batman's theme. And it's one of the most forgettable pieces of score I've heard. It's not bad, but I don't remember it. I mean, think about fucking 1989, like, Michael Keaton's Batman theme. Like, that's iconic. I mean, this one's not good. So, like, the main theme is solid, but they just... I didn't realize that they just reused it over and over again. <laughs> the one highlight I will give, the one that didn't fall into that pattern, I don't even remember it was in the movie. Um, but there's one called like Harvey Two-Face, and it's really cool because it actually starts like a ballad. It's like, oh, like, you know, it's like really happy and kind of upbeat. And then unsurprisingly, you know, it's called Harvey Two-Face for a reason. Like halfway through the song, it just like changes. And it's just kind of more like the rest of the movie's score um, to reflect the duality. Um but yeah, like everything I just said there, I don't know if that's a hot take. I love the movie, but this score, if I'm rating that, to me, it was just basically the same thing over and over again, like literally the same like few notes. Uh, yeah, so I got to go Harry Potter. I mean, if you're looking for variety, if you're looking for like whimsy and like actually feeling like you're in a location that a movie is presenting, I don't feel like I'm in Gotham City when I was into The Dark Knight. I mean, honestly, this was what I was referencing earlier. Like, if I didn't know this was The Dark Knight, and I like didn't remember it at all. And somebody told me this was any other action movie score. I would totally believe you. Like I would just buy into that. Whereas Harry Potter, it's just unmistakable. It's just this really beautiful and magical score. Score like I, I f- honestly feel like I'm with those characters in that location, going through this adventure with them, just as the score changes. Whereas, like I said, The Dark Knight to me is just the same thing over and over again. So I got to go Harry Potter. Yeah, I'm. I'm also. I'm going to agree with you, Matt, as well. Um, I honestly really thought The Dark Knight was better than... Mm -hmm. Because the movie's fantastic. There's no denying that. But I honestly thought the soundtrack was better as well until I started listening to it. And then that point you made about it being the same thing over and over, not only is it the same thing over and over, but it's also 13 minute long songs (laughs) over and over. How is that possible? Oh, Um, God. And I I think the biggest thing here is the Dark Knight soundtrack can't exist without the Dark Knight movie. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yes. The, when when uh, Kristen Bale is on screen as Batman, the Dark Knight soundtrack is perfect for that for that film. However, you can't have the Dark Knight soundtrack without also watching the movie at the same time. Like, you, you can't really listen to it on its own. It's not re-listenable. Oh, Whereas the Harry uh, yeah, the Harry okay. Potter yeah, the yeah, Harry yeah. Potter theme is. Um, and there's nothing about the Dark Knight soundtrack that puts me back in that movie or puts me back in the theater. Whereas the Harry Potter, like we talked about in the first round, the Harry Potter soundtrack does. It puts me back in Hogwarts. It puts me back in Hogsmeade. Um, so I think for that reason alone, Harry Potter's got to move on. That's a great point, actually. I think out of all of these, the Dark Knight stands the least on its own in terms of just like listening for an enjoyable experience. Anyway. Yeah. We, and when, and when we voted to put this as a one seater, we really, I really thought yeah. that it was better than I remembered. Yeah, I don't have too much to add on Harry Potter. You guys pretty much hit it all on point, you know, how each song kind of takes you through whatever um, the gang is doing at that particular moment in the movie. So I won't add too much there. I'll just say, yeah, I don't know if I have much to add. I'll I'll just say one thing about The Dark Knight, though, that I do like, but I'm still going to go with Harry Potter. And that's, I think it does a good job with the Joker. Not so much with Batman, but with the Joker. Definitely that scene where he comes into... Uh, wayne's skyscraper house i guess whatever yeah yeah and he's yeah yeah, yeah, he's uh the like tiktok you know yeah he's intimidating rachel and it has that in the in the background the music has that one long note the whole time he's like just you know grinding on her trying to get her that was they nailed it in that one that one you your nerves are going i agree that is like you said keith that is the one song that put me back into that scene i do agree yeah I think they nailed it with that one, so I really, I really loved it there. But, um, but yeah, overall, Harry Potter, I think, will take it for this one for me. All righty, Harry Potter is going to go on to face Star Wars in the semifinal. And speaking of one note repeating effectively, our next film here is Interstellar going up against Drive. 
Um, Interstellar is also composed by Hans Zimmer. It won the Saturn Award for Best Music. It was nominated for the Best Achievement in Music Award. It was nominated for the Golden Globe for the Best Original Score. And it was also nominated for a Grammy for the Best Score. And here is what a free version of Interstellar might sound like. Just the one note. <laughs> that is what it kind of sounded like, though. That okay. was pretty funny. All right. So who, who wants to tee this one up? I'll go first here. Um, even though we are making fun of it here, I am going to vote for Interstellar Overdrive. Um, I think Interstellar is just so great. There's so many scenes. There, there's so much listening to the soundtrack that it puts me back into this movie um that 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 like recurring theme that's plays throughout the movie well it wasn't very effective in the dark knight i think it is really effective here anytime i anytime i hear cornfield chase it puts me like it makes me feel like i'm an astronaut in space and i well i do love the drive soundtrack and i think it's so influential and really impactful um i don't get that same experience from the drive soundtrack where i do like in this interstellar soundtrack makes me feel like i'm in space every time it comes on when I, while i'm working like doing anything it makes me feel like i'm an astronaut in space exploring like the unknown or the or the um or like black holes like it just captures such like an, a such a sense of adventure in the soundtrack i feel like yeah i'm gonna go with interstellar on this one too and and this is, does not change anything that does not change the way I feel about Drive. I still think Drive nails it with their soundtrack, but I think Interstellar Interstellar nails it just a little bit more. Uh, like you said, Austin, you just feel like you're, yeah, like you're going to the unknown. That you're in space and and whatever they're doing, you feel like you're actually there. Um, one scene in particular I can think of, uh, you know, off the top of my head, is that docking scene. Whenever they they yeah. just got screwed uh, over, it's it gets here. It, it's so suspenseful. Yeah. It was when they just got screwed over by Matt Damon's character, and they're trying and they're trying to dock again, and they're spinning, and they're trying to calculate it to where they're spinning at the same time. That song in the background there captured that perfectly. So, um, yeah, Interstellar takes it for this one. Also, the the song titled "Stay" too. Um, even though the, even though the book say the bookcase scene does get shit on, the music playing in that scene is just so effective. I know. It's the yeah. perfect music to accompany Matthew McConaughey hiding behind a bookshelf, which he won <laughs> an Arnie Award Murph! a few weeks ago. Yeah, um, I don't even really like this movie that much. I think it's a bit overrated. It's definitely not too high on my list of Christopher Nolan movies, but this score is pretty incredible. I, if we're talking about atmospheric, I would be hard-pressed to find a better one than Interstellar. And like Austin said, while this style of Hans Zimmer score didn't really work, in something like Dark Knight, it really works here. I mean, I could listen to this without having ever seen the movie and feel like I'm exploring the unknown. I feel like I'm in space. I feel like I'm learning something new about like the universe. Like it's just so amazing. Um, the cornfield chase that we already brought up, truly, it was like as like kind of like a main theme. It's just top notch. I mean, it's so good, and I really had just like a really calming kind of. Um, enjoyable but also kind of otherworldly i would guess experience just kind of laying down with my eyes closed listening to parts of the score like it was a yeah, really it's kind so of, great kind of beautiful experience that i hadn't experienced in a long time when it came to listening to music and then like you guys said though i mean there also is variety like there are some exciting bits to the score here there's some suspenseful moments that like really caught me off guard and without even watching the movie um so yeah, in a weird way, like just listening to the score on its own may have been better than kind of watching the two and a half plus hour movie with some bits that don't work for me. But the score, I, I can't argue. It, it's so good. It really feels like um, Hans Zimmer like emailed Christopher Nolan and was like, hey, hey, Chris, like whatever you do next, I want to be a part of it. And Christopher Nolan was like, hey, Han, how you doing? I'm not going to tell you what my next movie is, but I want you to send me a soundtrack if I just told you the word adventure. And then Han was like, I got you, Chris. Here's what I can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely fits the tone of the movie. And even as it changes, the score changes with it, which I think is pretty key to an effective score all the way through. So we don't have to spend too much time. We all agree. I mean, it's great. Like, no doubt. Man, not a single one-seater has lost so far. Yeah. Let's see if that changes in this next battle. We have Indiana Jones going up against Blade Runner. Um, so Indiana Jones is also composed um, by John Williams. It's like our fourth John Williams movie 
in this contest. He's pretty good. It's going this up guy. against <laughs> it's going up against Blade Runner, which won in the first round. And here is what a free version of Indiana Jones ah, could sound like. Our last free version. That was the worst one so far. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we just we just ended with the worst one. That was garbage. <laughs> Keith, I feel like you have a strong opinion here. Why don't you go first? Yeah, it's funny because both these movies, uh, the main character is actually Harrison Ford. Oh yeah, there you go. And we've also established that you hate John Williams as well. Oh, that's right. I love John Williams. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, but and, yeah, Indiana Jones is going to take it from me. He's throwing. He's throwing that weak little bitch john williams of bone <laughs> <laughs> no all the respect to john williams now indiana jones is awesome mm-hmm. uh i think the theme definitely captures who he is as a character one song in particular besides the main theme song is the the, the ark of the covenant i don't know if y'all remember that from the raiders of the lost ark but that song um that always comes on when the ark of the covenant makes an appearance i thought was pretty cool and kind of menacing. Um, yeah, I think this one just captures it overall. Oh, one thing I was going to say earlier, going back to Star Wars, and or going back to John Williams with his ties to Star Wars and Indiana Jones, there's a scene in Phantom Menace when the droids come out onto the field in Naboo, and then there's the scenes in Indiana Jones when the Nazis make an appearance where there's a song that's pretty much identical in those two movies. Yeah, I'd have to show you guys later on, but I thought that was kind of cool how John Williams kind of just throws you a bone. If you're like, if you're just, you know, a George Lucas uh, fan, he kind of just throws you a bone with that. Like, Hey, remember this from this movie or whatever? Um, if that makes sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I like this theme song overall. So Indiana Jones for me. I disagree. Um, I'm going to okay. vote for Blade Runner. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, while I do, I do think the theme song of Indiana Jones is very iconic. I think that's the only thing about the score that's iconic. Everything else about the score, I just think it's very vanilla, especially for John Williams. Um, nothing about it really puts me back into any specific scenes. And I, I think of all the John of, the, of all the John Williams scores here, I think Indiana Jones is the least impactful one. Um, the, literally, the only thing I can think about when I'm listening to the score is just Indiana running. And like literally nothing else, like no specific scenes, nothing else, just him running. Um, Whereas with Blade Runner, like kind of, kind of like we already talked about, um, it's so unique. It doesn't sound like anything that you've heard before, especially for coming out when it did. Um, It puts you back in that scene where he's answering those questions or in the bar. Um, I just, I really think the Blade Runner score is so much different uh, from anything that we have going on to the finals. And I think we got to go with that one. Yeah. This was the hard. This is the hardest one for me so far. Um, so while I agree that the best part and the most iconic part about the score is the theme, I think that's fine. The thing that's really cool about this movie, and I think it may have been done on purpose because it like, you know, the movie's set in the '30s. Like, while I don't even know the names of the rest of the score. It's pretty cool how the rest of it almost feels like it's something from a silent film. It's like if you've ever seen silent movies like Charlie Chaplin or just any silent movie, like obviously since there was no like dialogue we could hear, there's just music constantly playing. And that's kind of how this feels. It feels like it's just the epitome of adventure. It feels like this movie basically starts and it just lasts for two hours and it's just like an adventure from beginning to end. It really does feel like that. Um, and I think it's so iconic and incredible. The part I'm struggling with, though, is... Is it any different from any other John Williams score, though? Because I don't think it is. I guess different. Like like he said, it sounds exactly like Star Wars. Some songs. No, the whole thing. (laughs) No, not the whole thing. (laughs) Actually, it was only one song in particular that it sounded like Star Wars. But what I guess what I'm getting at here is, like, there were times when I was listening to the Indiana Jones soundtrack, and I literally was like, is this Star Wars? And then I would check my phone and it would still be Indiana Jones. Like, I just think he does the same. I just feel like he does the same thing here that he does with Star Wars. Where like, um, and I just think he does it better in Star Wars than he does in Indiana Jones. That may be true. I can agree with that to but some, I'm trying to decide to some extent. It's better than Blade Runner. I'm trying to put that out of my head. Is this better than Star Wars? I don't think so. 
Okay, let me let me ask you this. Forget it. Forget if it's better better than Star Wars or not. Is Indiana Jones soundtrack unlike anything you've heard before? That's that was the point you made that is sticking with me. Like the Blade Runner still feels like an iconic revolutionary soundtrack, and it's one of the more atmospheric ones. I think only compared to Interstellar, does it feel like I'm actually. I'm not just in Hogwarts, like with the Harry Potter one. It's like I'm in the world that they're presenting. That's how I feel with Interstellar. That's how I feel with Blade Runner. Well, and that's funny you bring it up because if you move Blade Runner on, we'll have to debate that. We'll have to debate Interstellar versus Blade Runner. I'm just trying to decide specifically if Indiana Jones is better than Blade Runner. I, I love Indiana Jones. I clearly love it. I you know I love it more than Austin. Um, and like I said, it really does just, it's so cool how it's like the beginning to end of an adventure. And even the parts that are so mundane, like literally, like like the the parts of the movie where they're just like flying from one location to another it's still exciting somehow like with the music like talk about engaging i mean it's just they really nailed it in that aspect it always is amping you up to something to come and then when you do hit the action beats it's just they somehow keep that momentum going with the score Ugh. but again you wanted I'm... action if you wanted action we had mad max in the first round baby <laughs> if you wanted action, you could have gone with Mad Max. That was too much. I was too tired after. I was too tired. This is tough, man. Keith, do you have any more? Austin's been selling me. Do you have anything you could sell me with here? Do you have any any anything you could get me over the edge? I mean, Keith Keith already basically helped my argument where he said, hey, there's a portion of Indiana Jones that's the same song except, as in Star Wars. Except, like, except my argument was like, that is like, like that, that was why it was good, though. So that's what, that was kind of funny about it. Here's what I'll say. I think Austin is massively underselling how good the Indiana Jones score is. I, but, we put it as a one-seater. I still think it's good. But... I think I will ultimately, as this is clearly the hardest for me, I think I'm going to go Blade Runner. I, no! And I honestly, suck it, Keith! I honestly don't even feel that good about saying it. <laughs> uh, I don't feel good about you saying it either. <laughs> and I don't feel, you, sound like, you sound like Hayden Christensen right there. I don't feel good about you saying it either, man. I <laughs> oh, well, man. Keith, you can just go cry by yourself and listen to that indiana jones star wars song that you like so much well speaking of star wars speaking of star wars keith is gonna have to speaking push star wars. extra hard right here i'm curious where this one's gonna go okay let's get into the finals and we've got star wars going against harry potter it's john versus john who wants to go first here? Keith, I'm still traumatized from last round. I, you take it away. Give, give me a moment to rest. This one's hard. Really? I don't <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars again, man. Star Wars is iconic. It's the best soundtrack of all time. Ooh, you can't beat it. Teasing his future You can't thoughts. beat it. All right, all right. Respect Harry Potter, but... No, Star Wars takes it. I feel, Sorry. I feel you. I think, and for talking iconic, I mean, Star Wars wins. But I think I know where I'm gonna. I think I know where I'm gonna go. But I want to hear what Austin has to say first. I do agree, Star Wars is iconic. But we're not debating iconic here. Mm. We're debating what we enjoy to listen to. We're debating what puts us back in certain scenes, and we're debating what makes a movie better. And I do agree with you that uh, Star Wars does really elevate like the star wars soundtrack really elevates some of the shitty movies obviously because you know we're talking about the phantom menace uh here and we still think it's a really good soundtrack however other than duel duel the fates there's not really any star wars like theme that puts me back in the specific scene whereas with harry potter like we've already talked about i'm back at hogwarts i'm living harry's life i'm a wonderful wizard so i'm gonna vote harry potter here Okay. I think while I've been championing Harry Potter most of this time, and while everything Austin said is 100% true, except I think I do get taken back to some other scenes with the Star Wars um, score, I think he is ultimately right. But if I'm going off the best score, like, while the Harry Potter theme is just next level, in my opinion, um, it's one of the best things John Williams has ever composed frankly, I think. And I like I pointed out the Christmas themes and just like the little individual themes throughout the movie. I think 
the heights that I need to hit emotionally. I feel like Star Wars covers the gamut. We got like action scenes. We got like really like we got romance. We got emotion. We got just straight drama. We got mundane scenes. They're just flying around even that the score is exciting. And I gotta say, maybe I'm overselling it, but I think Duel of the Fates is like one of the best things John Williams has ever done. I think if I'm looking at a piece overall, I think I'm gonna have to go Star Wars. Yeah! <laughs> wedge! Wedge! It's Wedge! <laughs> Star Wars will go on to the Arnie's Championship, but we got one more round in our semifinals, and we have Interstellar against. Blade Runner. I'll go first here. I think I'm going to vote Interstellar. Um, everything that I said about Blade Runner in the last round being unique, I do mean. However, um, I think Blade Runner's age here might be working against it because I do think Blade Runner was unique for its time, but I think I have heard things that sound similar to it. Whereas with Interstellar, I've never heard anything like the soundtrack before. And I think we kind of already touched on it, but the sense of adventure that I get from listening to the Interstellar soundtrack, I don't get that from Blade Runner, and I really don't get that from any other soundtrack here on this list. So I think I'm going to push on, or I'm going to push my vote for Interstellar here. Yeah, I'm going to go with Interstellar in this one too. Um, Blade Runner, still awesome soundtrack. Definitely has a good variety of songs pertaining, pertaining to different scenes, but like I said earlier, Interstellar just it just clicks with with everything going on in that movie with space the unknown uh, the ships all the action sequences all the sadness it just it just fits uh, perfectly so yeah I'm gonna go with Interstellar this is tricky like I said earlier I think out of everything on this list in terms of feeling like you're part of a larger world I think Interstellar and Blade Runner are the two best. I think, honestly, they're so close that I just have to go off of which one gives me a bit more. And mm, this one actually is really close for me. It's got to be Interstellar then, right? Because you talked about how much you enjoyed laying down, closing your eyes, feeling like you're in space. Yeah, I think I will go Interstellar. I do think Blade Runner does the same thing, though. It's just, it's not like I'm in space. It's just like I'm in a cyberpunk, like, Los Angeles-like world. Like, this gritty, underground, gross world that still has this, like, feels like we're just, like, on the brink of something scary, but also, like, the advancement is cool. And I feel like it does a lot. And I feel like in terms of emotion, not just, like, you know, I don't mean emotion, just, like, in terms of, like, like nostalgic or like sad feelings but i do like like i mentioned just in the very beginning that even just with like a synth or electronic score i still find it so impressive that blade runner can still like hit action beats it can hit like a love theme using kind of the same through line and instruments i think that is really impressive and it does it does that way better than interstellar um i think it makes use of like a smaller scale better but if I am going to go best, I, yeah, I think I'd go Interstellar as well. Okay, let's get into our final round. And we've got two space movies. We've also got John versus Han. <clears throat> we've got Star Wars versus Interstellar. And I think to really get us into the mood, we got to hear both of those free soundtracks again. Mm -hmm. Let's hear the free Star Wars versus the free Interstellar. Here we go. This one sucks. <laughs> Sounds like the intro to like a shitty movie in like the 2000s. And Interstellar is also terrible. <laughs> Are we sure this isn't the part that Bono <laughs> sang during the remake Inter of the Mission Impossible thing? Interstellar is like meditation music. <laughs> yeah. Good thing we're not debating those free runs. We are debating the good versions. This is impossible. I mean, if if any of you two have like a strong leaning, I'd go for it. Because I really honestly don't right now. I guess I don't really have a super strong leaning. Um, I think both these soundtracks are incredible. However, I think I might give the edge to Interstellar. Just because of the experience I get from listening to this soundtrack. Um, this is kind of like what I talked about with Mad Max. This is a soundtrack I always find myself coming back to. It's just so enjoyable to listen to. It really, like, it takes me out of my own head 
I guess and I mean just it just transports me into this like sense of adventure and I know I keep saying that over and over but the soundtrack just captures it so well um and whereas with Star Wars like I really enjoy the soundtrack and I enjoy Duel of the Fates I enjoy the Vader theme but I don't get that same experience just from solely listening to the soundtrack on its own and so I think for right for the purpose of this discussion I'm going to give the edge to Interstellar all right all good points um I kind of, for me, I'm going to let Keith go first, but it kind of almost feels like we're debating right now the most iconic score of all time versus, not the best of all time, but it's like, we're kind of debating like iconic versus quality, maybe. Maybe that's something. I don't know. But Keith, what are your thoughts? We all know you hate John, so we're gonna, you're going to vote for Han, right? <laughs> I got to go with Johnny Boy on this one. <laughs> but it's tough because I, I have a lot of respect for the Interstellar soundtrack. Um for all the points I said earlier, but Star Wars. When I think of Star Wars, I think of when those words come on the sh- on, when those words come on the screen, saying "A long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away," and then the song hits and those roll and the rolling intro comes on. I love that. That takes me back when I'm when I was a kid. Like if I hear that song anywhere, it still makes me happy. And then and just thinking of uh, "Duel of the Fates," I think that song is just badass. Like we were talking about earlier. Um, I and it and it I think it goes perfect with the theme of Darth Maul fighting Obi Wan and Qui-Gon and just it and so and then all the other songs in between I think did pretty decent so and then yeah it's, it's just Star Wars. I can't I, I I wish I could explain it better than that, but it's Star Wars. I love it. <laughs> I can't get away from it. So <laughs> Well Keith, we uh, all know you love Star Wars. We all know we all it. Know. You're a super fan. <laughs> Matthew you get to pick what the official best soundtrack of the Army's podcast is. <laughs> it's all come down to you. We know how upset you were in our last debate, but you have the position of power here. That does feel Who's good. Who's it going to be? It does feel good. I feel like a Chancellor Palpatine right now. Here's what's here's what here's what's going on right now. Keith, like Austin, made fantastic points. He said something. It made me think while he was speaking. He said that I love the opening theme. I love Duel of the Fates, as do I. I feel like I might even be the number one Duel of the Fates fan here. Like, just in terms of individual bits of score that we're talking about today. Is there anything better than Duel of the Fates? I don't know. I don't know. Who's to say? But here's the deal. Here's what's going to do. Here's what's going to get me to my answer. He also said, and I love everything in between, as do I. I do as well. There's so many great bits that they repurpose from the originals. There's some original bits added just for this movie that are great. And you kind of like Indiana Jones, like you always feel like things are moving forward. You're on an adventure of some kind. Is it that exciting of an adventure when you watch the movie? No, but it still takes you on a journey. The thing about Interstellar is I don't think... There is anything in between. And there's not even really... This is going to sound so fucking stupid. And I feel like if Christopher Nolan's listening, he's like, well, that was my point. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I don't feel like there's a beginning <laughs> or an end to the Interstellar score. I don't even think... There is like a, a bookcase. There's not even a fucking middle. There's just a bookshelf that Matthew McConaughey yells from behind. But <laughs> like I said, I guess nothing's going to beat that experience of me just lying down with my eyes closed listening to it. I just felt like it came over me. I was part of that world. I was exploring... Like, it wasn't like if I listened to the Star Wars theme, like, oh, great, I'm, here, here here comes the main title crawl. Oh, finally, I'm at Duel of the Fates. I love this one. With Interstellar, it was just... Did it always reach the heights of Star Wars? No. But I just felt like I was in this world for the entire time that I listened to it. And like I said, does that mean it's better than Star Wars? I don't know. But it was definitely an experience, both in the theater and re-listening to it, that was pretty unrivaled. I think... I'm shocked to say it. This was not what I was expecting, but I think I'm going to go Interstellar as well. Wow. Wow. Congratulations to Han. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best award you'll have ever received, even better yeah. than that Grammy or that Oscar nomination. Interstellar yeah. is the official best soundtrack of the Arnie's podcast. Wow. Okay. So even though we've already given out a huge award today. As everybody listening knows, we always have to do our own individual award ceremony. 
And it's the Arnie's Podcast Awards, baby. Let's get into it. Austin, I just you got you got to start us off this time. I know I know you got something good cooking. I feel like after my Mad Max debate, everyone's got to be expecting it. I'm going to give the best guitar player to the Doof Warrior in Mad That's Max. Fair. That's I love fair. that guy. He's my favorite. I like that he's in a little gimp suit. There's nothing more that I enjoy seeing on screen <laughs> than that guy <laughs> playing guitar. Congratulations to the Doof Warrior. Fair. That's a, that's, a, that's an honor. Keith, I know you're going to be respectful and honor these films and these scores. I just, what do you have to say? What award, are, what award are you giving out? Does this award have to be to anybody involved in these scores? I would say how do so. I, how do I always have to explain the rules to you here, Keith? <laughs> it can be for anything. <laughs> yeah, Keith, Keith, just go for it. Just say what's on your mind. I re- just say what's on your mind. <laughs> you aren't... You- <laughs> You aren't wrong. I really do forget. Like, what are we doing the awards over again? <laughs> you got it. Just, just say it. Just say it. It'll work. Since the since Austin was challenging my love oh. for John Williams, mm-hmm. he was. I'm gonna give him an award to my. I'm gonna give him an award to myself. <gasps> oh, <tonight>. whoa! Wow. <laughs> for the biggest John Williams fan. Whoa. Wow. Wow. Okay, that's a good award. I guess. Well, I'm gonna change my award and give an award to Keith Baker and make him the biggest John Williams hater. Oh, whoa, we've never we've never seen that happen. Keith just got a Razzie and an Oscar. What? <laughs> okay, I'm not even going to change my award because I'm not joking. The reason I wanted to do this was because I am also giving an award to Keith Baker. <laughs> and it is for the most disappointed in the outcome of a show we've done. <laughs> <laughs> Keith is hiding it well. He's laughing. He's having a good time. But deep down, he is pissed that Star Wars <laughs> lost and that Indiana Jones didn't go farther. <laughs> We gotta applaud him for being a team player. <laughs> so Keith, oh, he's so wow. angry. That's his, little, fir- his little bald head is turning red. <laughs> That's the first time in Arnie show history that the same person has won all three of our awards, but for a different reason. <laughs> oh. Okay. Alrighty. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you wouldn't mind sharing us with a friend, just one friend, we'd really appreciate it so we can continue to grow the show. At The Arnie's is our social, and TheArnie's.media is the website. Our Star Wars series, Keith, our Star Wars series will be back next week with the first film of the new trilogy, The Force Awakens. And everyone, we also launched a bonus series that's covering season two of The Boys as each episode comes out week to week. This is hosted by me. Um, who we all know is what the social network fan, I guess, of this show. My love didn't take that too far. Um, <laughs> you can hear a new episode every Thursday when we're breaking down the latest episode of The Boys Season 2. Right now, if you check our podcast feed, we've already reviewed the uh, kind of premiere of Season 2, which was the first three episodes that they released at once. So go check that out if you're a Boys fan. Come listen to us break it down with the podcast within a podcast. The Boys talking the Boys. And Keith is going to get caught up soon and he's going to be joining us. All right, everybody. Feel free to direct message us on Instagram with your thoughts on this show. And give us your opinion on who you think the best soundtrack was. All right. And yeah, everybody, once again, that's at the Arnie's on Instagram. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll be back on Tuesday and we'll be back to Star Wars. Bye, everybody. (laughs) 